Hello, Cherry Creek. I have Dr. Bandaram here to talk to you about what she does. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop my video and the whole show is yours. So appreciate you taking time to talk to our kids today. Great. Thanks, Mr. Stirrup. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this series. Hello, everyone. I am Vidya Bandaram. I am a transplant nephrologist. Um, and um, I work at the Presbyterian St. Luke's Kidney Transplant Program. I'm also the medical director of the kidney program over there. And uh, really glad to be a part of this series. And um, um, I'm um, uh, thrilled to be doing this uh, virtual. It would have been better to have seen you all, but hopefully we can do that uh, next year. Um, so when Mr. Stirrup asked me to um, uh, present as a part of the medical class, I was wondering how I could sort of bring together the, the world of nephrology to you guys, but also um, some of the more practical aspects of how you could become a nephrologist if you choose to, and um, some of the statistics around, um, um, around nephrology practice across the country. So hopefully we'll have covered uh, all of that. And then you guys, uh, you can always get it back in touch with me if you had specific questions. So a little bit about me. I am a full-time adult general and transplant nephrologist. So I take care of patients that have kidney disease. And when I say general, meaning that I take care of patients that don't have a kidney transplant, um, but I specialize in taking care of patients that have a kidney transplant. So I spend about 80% of my time doing transplant work and about 20% taking care of non-transplant patients. I'm an adult nephrologist, meaning that I don't do pediatric work. Um, that is a complete different uh, subspecialty altogether. You become a pediatrician and then you go on to specialize in nephrology. Um, my husband is a computer science engineer and we have three boys. Our twins are going into fifth grade at Cottonwood Creek Elementary and I have a uh, little one who is going into second grade. We also have a new puppy. Uh, he's uh, only about four months old, and so we've all, we all been busy during the uh, pandemic just trying to take care of him. So we moved to Colorado in 2010, and I know for a fact that we are never leaving Denver. We just love it here. So uh, some of the terminology that you're going to come across, um, we'll talk about the nephron which is a filtering unit within each kidney. And we'll talk about what they do and how our kidneys really help um, relieving our body of the toxins that are built up every day. Um, and uh, a nephrologist is not to be confused with a urologist. So I am a medical doctor, meaning that uh, I do not do surgery. And a urologist is my surgical counterpart who takes care of either taking out kidney stones, uh, relieving an obstruction within a kidney, they might put in stents, they might take a kidney out, um, either if someone wants to donate a kidney or if someone has kidney cancer. Um, so they are the surgical counterpart or nephrologist or the medical side of it. So I prescribe medications uh, do follow-up labs and follow patients throughout their lifetime. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about transplantation and what that entails. In general, transplant means that you are taking an organ from another person and putting it in your patient because that patient's kidney doesn't work. Um, it's a very interesting, very uh, important um, advancement in the kidney world because it does really prolong life. You live longer with a kidney transplant than if you just stayed on dialysis. So what is dialysis? We'll talk about that. What a dialysis machine looks like. How do patients get hooked up to a dialysis machine, etc. So we'll go through um, some of all of that. So I want to kind of cover 
the, the medical part of this so that then when we talk about what my typical day looks like or how you become a nephrologist, you will have a better sense of what you would be doing during the day. So let's kind of talk about the medical aspects of, of kidney disease. Um, so <clears throat> chronic kidney disease in the United States um, is, a, is a big entity. Uh, chronic means something that has been going on for a really long time, um, as opposed to acute that happens suddenly. So the estimate is that 15% of the United States adults, so that's about 37 million people, are estimated to have um, chronic kidney disease that's based on some of the large studies that have been done um, uh, looking at uh, kidney function tests. But unfortunately, nine out of 10 adults with kidney disease do not know that they have it. And when I say CKD, it's chronic kidney disease. So most adults don't know. You just don't have symptoms of kidney disease until it's very late. Until your kidney function is down to, let's say, 15%, you may not have symptoms. And so it's important for um, the general population to recognize the risk factors that might um, lead you to develop kidney disease and then fo start following up regularly with your primary care physician, doing blood work, because blood tests is the only way that you would know you have kidney problems um, early on before it's too late, before you start developing symptoms. Now, one in two people with very low kidney function who are not on dialysis also do not know that they have kidney disease, okay? So this is, this is important because you just, on the outside, you can't tell if someone has kidney disease and it's important to get blood, blood work done, especially if you have some of the risk factors. So some of the other facts about the prevalence um, of kidney disease in the United States, it is more common in the older population. You see here, you know, the, this is 65 plus. And so you see that there is a big chunk of that population that develops kidney disease. Um, it's less frequent in the younger population. And we'll talk about some of the causes of kidney disease. Um, it's slightly more common in, in women compared to men. Um, it's more common in non-Hispanic blacks compared to non-Hispanic whites or Asians um, as well. So kidney disease is, um, is important and it's, it's actually quite prevalent because of the risk factors that are quite prevalent. So the highest, the biggest risk factors for kidney disease are diabetes and high blood pressure. And as you can imagine, those two are, uh, again, chronic diseases that are very prevalent in the general population. Um, the longer you've had diabetes and high blood pressure, meaning hypertension, the greater is your risk for developing kidney disease. And the more uncontrolled the diabetes and high blood pressure are, the greater is your risk of developing kidney disease. And of course, there are other risk factors that include someone that has heart disease, um, obesity. If you've had a family history of kidney disease, there are um, kidney problems that run in, in families. For instance, polycystic kidney disease, you, you just develop innumerable cysts within the within both kidneys and that eventually those cysts eventually just uh, occupy the the kidneys and then you you um, have the decreasing kidney function uh, of course any past damage to the kidneys and and as you age actually you lose kidney function as a result of um, old age so it's important to recognize the risk factors important to follow up closely with your, do your regular physical exams with your primary care physician. And if your primary care physician detects on your blood work that you are developing kidney disease, meaning that your kidney toxins in your bloodstream are high, then it's a good idea to establish care with a nephrologist. Um, so that that nephrologist then can identify the risk factors, mitigate those that can then prevent the progression of kidney disease because kidney disease is a progressive disorder. It continues to get worse, especially if those risk factors are not, um, are not um, uh, addressed. So patients then progress on to dialysis, which we 
equate with end stage kidney disease. And then you just, you kind of stay on dialysis. It is a life saving procedure. If you don't do dialysis then the kidney toxins just build up in your bloodstream and um, you, you pass away because your toxins just build up. Now the option is really, instead of staying on dialysis, the option would be then to get a kidney transplant, which would then give you normal kidney function. And that is exactly why a kidney transplant prolongs life. You live longer than if you just stayed on dialysis. So staggering number of patients that are on dialysis um, currently, 746,000. So this is actually a big chunk of the Medicare spending dollars. Um, and um, the Medicare spending on both the chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease, so that's the ESRD, end-stage renal disease patients. Um, it, the estimate is 120 billion, but you know that's uh, again that uh, uh, keeps changing, but it's around that number. Um, and so then when you go on dialysis, you can get hooked up with a transplant center and get waitlisted for a kidney transplant. And um, you can see that there are, um, at least in 2017, there were 75,000 patients. The current number is close to 85 to 90,000 patients on the transplant waitlist. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So just to give an idea of what the kidney does and how it goes about filtering your bloodstream of, of the um, toxins. So um, this is the picture of the kidney. So our kidneys are kind of in the back, mid back, and um, kidneys are about the size of your fist. And they, and they, larger kidneys, larger person has larger kidneys. Um, we all have two kidneys. And these tubes that are coming out of the kidneys are called ureters. So they carry the urine that's made in the kidneys. The urine tracks in the ureters and then reaches the bladder. It's stored in our urinary bladder and then um, until you urinate. So in terms of the blood supply to the kidneys, you see that these are um, pretty big blood vessels that come out of the, the aorta that comes out of the heart. So this is your descending aorta in your abdomen. Um, and the renal arteries, so renal, again, refers to kidney. The renal arteries come out of the aorta to supply blood flow to the right and the left kidney. This is the inferior vena cava, which receives the renal veins that collect the impure your blood from both the kidneys. So left renal vein and right renal vein, and they go on to the inferior vena cava, and then that goes back to the heart. So um, to get a better sense of uh, the filtering um, units within the kidney, so this is again a cross section of what the kidney looks like on the inside. And the outer part, as well as some of the intervening um, tissue here, is called the renal cortex. And that is where most of the filtering units actually reside. So each filtering unit is called a nephron. And each kidney has a million to a million and a half little tiny filters through which the blood then circulates and um, the filters then clean it up. So the filters are, are located actually within the cortex. The tubes, and we'll go over that, but the, the tubes that carry urine are, are located in the renal medulla, and they actually uh, help in filtering again and um, um, regulating some of our electrolytes. The urine is then collected in the collecting system, which are these spaces over here, and then tracks out through the ureter. So each nephron, this is what it looks like. This is the filtering unit here, the whole, the whole uh, picture that you see. It has a bunch of blood vessels that actually come out of the renal artery that form the glomerulus. And this is the capsule through which the uh, filtering takes place. The, um, the fluid then tracks through these several tubes. And as it's doing that, it's actually exchanging 
um, electrolytes. So sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, it's really um, regulating uh, um, all of that. And then eventually the uh, urine that is made is then goes into the collecting ducts that that's those reside in the in the renal medulla and then from that into the collecting system and then out into the ureter so so then what is dialysis so like i said you know kidney disease is a progressive disorder right and um there are um interventions that you can um, do to uh, uh, slow down the progress progression of kidney disease, such as if a patient is taking medications um, that is, that are damaging to the kidney, you could stop those and stop the progression. Um, uh, non steroidals, so commonly used um, Motrin, Advil, Aleve, ibuprofen in high doses are definitely kidney toxic, especially if someone has known kidney disease such as diabetes or a hypertension related kidney disease. And then on top of that, they're taking these um, pain medications. Uh, they, their kidney disease could progress very, very fast. So you could stop medications. You could get your diabetes under better control, get your blood pressure under better control. There are kidney diseases that are related to inflammation within the kidney. And those are called glomerulonephritis. Nef nephritis, again, nephron is kidney filtering unit. Itis is the um, suffix that indicates inflammation of that particular organ. So glomerulonephritis is, a, is an inflammation within the kidney filters, um, and that can occur due to someone having lupus, for instance, or some other autoimmune conditions. Um, those can lead to kidney disease, and those are usually treated with some type of immunosuppression, treated with steroids, etc. So unfortunately, sometimes despite trying to slow down the progression of kidney disease, um, you know, patients do go on to what we call end stage. And that's the point at which uh, patients then move on to the phase of dialysis. So um, you might start developing symptoms, right? And so metallic taste in the mouth, poor appetite, uh, extreme fatigue, uh, lethargy, drowsiness, memory problems. Um, my lungs might start filling up with fluid because my kidneys are having a hard time uh, making urine and, and dumping it out, whatever fluid that I get, you know, drinking water with the food, etc. cetera. Um, and then my feet might start swelling up if I know if my kidney disease is getting worse. Um, and so that's the point that, and clearly the blood levels of the kidney toxins will start tracking up. And so that's the point that we say that, you know, based on the symptoms and the blood work that that patient is ready then to start dialysis because otherwise kidney toxins will just continue to build up. So dialysis is a procedure of hooking up a patient to what's called a dialysis machine that will um, help take over the functions of the kidney so that patient can continue living uh, longer. So there are two different types of dialysis. There is hemodialysis. Hemo means blood dialysis. And the other is a peritoneal dialysis. So peritoneum is the covering of our, of our um, uh, the, its peritoneal membrane is a covering in our, in our abdomen. So there are two different ways you can do dialysis. So in hemodialysis, you gain access to the bloodstream of the patient. So either by placing a, what we call a dialysis catheter in the neck, in one of the big vessels, so in your jugular vein uh, or your subclavian vein, you might place what's called a dialysis catheter. It's an IV line, um, quite a wide bore IV. Uh, and that's, we usually do that when the, it's an emergency to start dialysis. If someone's potassium is really high, someone's acid levels are really high, or toxins are really high, or the patient's completely comatose and, or lethargic, then that's an emergency. So we place a dialysis catheter, and then that catheter has kind of two ports. Uh, one port is hooked up to 
both ports are hooked up to the dialysis machine, but one port actually pulls blood, circulates it through the dialysis machine, cleans it up, and gives back the clean blood through the other port. Um, the other way to access blood is what we call a fistula, and this is what you see in this um, picture here, and I have another picture of a fistula, how that's created. But a fistula is basically, in, it, it's a, um, it's created uh, by uh, sewing an artery to a vein, uh, and then the vein then becomes bigger to be able to cannulate it. And the dialysis nurse would put in uh, a needle into the fistula and then hook that patient up. So again, blood is removed uh, and it's connected to a dialysis machine. Blood is removed for cleaning. Um, it goes through what we call a filter or a dialyzer. The dialyzer cleans up the blood and then returns um, clean blood through the fistula again. So the dialysis machine is actually equipped with several uh, 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 instruments and gauges so that we are doing this in the safest manner as possible. So it has a pressure monitor, it has a pressure monitor, it has a blood pump that regulates your blood flow, um, it has an air trap that can trap any air bubbles because we don't want to put air bubbles in some, into someone's uh, circulation. And, um, and um, so these are, you know, when a patient is on dialysis, the dialysis nurse is constantly watching all of these gauges to make sure that, um, uh, uh, that the patient's not at risk. So um, usually patients go into a dialysis unit. There are several dialysis units. Um, and um, they go in there, they sit in a chair. The nurse will then hook up the patient to dialysis. They sit there. Usual dialysis treatments last about three and a half to four hours. And patients either listen to music or read a book. Sometimes they just sleep. Um, and they sit there, dialysis keeps going, and then at the end of four hours, the nurse unhooks the patient of the machine, and then they drive home. Dialysis in an outpatient dialysis setting is usually performed three times a week. So patients either go on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule, or a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday schedule. And um, it's not easy. It's a very uh, hard schedule to maintain. Uh, but if they miss dialysis, they do really get quite sick. So compliance is of utmost importance. The other type of dialysis is the peritoneal dialysis. And that does not require someone to go into a dialysis unit. So people have jobs, people want to travel, right? So you don't want to get uh, stuck at a dialysis unit uh, for four hours, three times a week. And so um, the other option is to do what we call the peritoneal dialysis. And that is where you use your abdomen, your belly, as a dialysis machine. So the dialysis company sends you these bags of dialysis fluid. And if, before that, what happens is that the surgeon puts in what we call the dialysis catheter, a peritoneal dialysis catheter in your belly. So it, go, it goes in, one end is inside, and the other end is kind of sticking out, and you just tape it and wear a shirt over it. And uh, you get trained to use a PD or peritoneal dialysis machine, and you hook yourself up to that machine with the bags, with the dialysate bags, and you, the, the machine helps drain the dialysate fluid into the belly. While the fluid is sitting there in the belly, it's actually doing dialysis. It's sucking out waste uh, products and fluid and chemicals out of your bloodstream through this peritoneal membrane in our, in our abdomen. And then at the end of that, the fluid is then drained out by the machine. The dialysate, the sort of the dirty dialysis is then drained out of the body. That is called one exchange. So the fluid that's going in sits in there and then fluid gets uh, dumped out. That's called one exchange. And so patients might hook themselves up to the machine, let's say at night before they go to bed. And then we teach them how to um, regulate the machine and they compute the number of exchanges that happen during the night when the patient is sleeping. And so as a patient's sleeping, the 
machine then takes care of dumping fluid in, dialyzing, and then dumping fluid out. So the patient might get four or five exchanges that night. And then the patient wakes up in the morning, unhooks himself, and then goes to work. Or, and then so it gives, the peritoneal dialysis really gives patients tremendous flexibility and lifestyle choice compared to hemodialysis where you have to go to a dialysis unit and sit there you know, for four hours, three times a week. So both modalities, we have seen, we see patients um, make choices either way, depending on what their uh, preference is, and patients tend to do really well. So we talked about the fistula uh, and how you are able to access your blood vessels in a hemodialysis setting. And uh, that's, uh, you know, we have, we have these arteries, the, the, the radial artery, uh, the cephalic vein, uh, so you could you could anastomose. So that's what the surgeons do: is they anastomose, they hook up the an artery to the vein. So that's one site that they could use. This is another site that the AVF, a arterial venous fistula anastomosis, can be done, uh, or that's third site. And so what happens is that when you then hook up an artery to the vein. The, um, the blood flow through that vein increases tremendously. And over a period of about four to six weeks, that vein really grows quite big and thick. And then that becomes really easy then for the nurse to cannulate that particular vein to then hook up the patient to the dialysis machine. Uh, and it can also sustain, because the vein is now so big, it can also sustain the flow rates, the tremendous blood flow rates through um, dialysis. So what about kidney transplant? And um, <coughs> what, do you, what, what does kidney transplant entail? So you could continue on dialysis lifelong, um, but dialysis is a very inflammatory state. And so patients are very much more susceptible to heart disease and heart attacks and infections, things like that well, when they're on dialysis. Uh, the mortality rate, so that means the risk of dying um, while you're receiving dialysis is, is a 20 percent in the first year after you start dialysis and then 15 percent every year after that. So you can see how quickly that's going to build up to 80 percent risk of dying. So. Um, the, the preferred mode of treatment then for end-stage kidney disease patients is to perform a kidney transplant. And um, you get hooked up with a transplant center. Uh, Denver has three transplant programs, so the University Hospital, Presbyterian St. Luke's, and Porter uh, transplant program. And um, you, you go there, you see a transplant nephrologist, you start getting your tests, and then you get listed for a kidney transplant. Um, so in the United States, there are about 99,000 patients waiting for a kidney transplant. And unfortunately, only about 20,000 transplants are performed each year. Okay, and then we'll, we'll go over why that is the case. Um, and like we talked about, transplant prolongs life. It's better, it gives you better survival than dialysis. And this is not, and you know, we're not talking about you're going to live five years more uh, compared to if you were on dialysis. We're talking about 20, 30 years, extra years of survival compared to dialysis. So huge difference. And so the goal for every patient is to go through the evaluation through a transplant center to see if they would qualify. So anyone really that has end stage kidney disease, um, should be referred for a transplant evaluation, um, and preferably before going on dialysis. So your kidney disease could be progressing through different stages, stage one through five. And we tell, um, we tell nephrologists to refer patients to the transplant center when they're about C uh, kidney disease stage four. Um, Preferably, we want them to get a kidney transplant before they're on the dialysis machine. And that is because they, when they looked at large studies and compared the two groups, so patients that have kidney disease go on to get a kidney transplant before they touch a dialysis machine, 
or if they've been on dialysis for a very short duration, let's say less than a year, versus patients that had progressive kidney disease, went on to dialysis, did several years of dialysis, and then went on to kidney transplant. They found that patients that uh, went on to transplant without dialysis did better. So they lived longer, their kidneys, the kidney transplant worked longer, they had fewer complications. And so that's the recommendation is that preferably before touching a dialysis machine for you to get transplanted. So how does that happen? So we get referrals through the transplant center and then they undergo an extensive evaluation. We check their heart, we check for infections, we check for blood clots. Do they have a history of cancer? Do they have lung disease? Do they have any other any problems with anesthesia? What surgeries have they had? So they undergo an extensive evaluation. And at the end of it, um, if they get approved for a kidney transplant, that they are a good candidate, then they get listed on the national wait list. And so um, you could get a transplant from a living donor, so a friend, family member that volunteers to give up one of their kidneys. So we all have two kidneys, but we actually, if you're healthy, you can actually live with one kidney uh, and um, uh, have a normal lifespan. Um, so you could get a living donor from a friend or family that says that they want to donate one of their kidneys, or you could get a kidney from a deceased donor. So someone that's died in a motor vehicle accident or a stroke, um, or drug overdose, something like that. So um, the, um, the, uh, the difference though is that if you get a kidney from a living donor, those kidneys last much longer. A deceased donor kidney transplant would last on an average eight to 10 years, whereas a living donor transplant can last 20 years. We have some patients that are on their 35th year of kidney transplant. Um, and then of course, if unfortunately, you, there, is, there is a tremendous shortage of organs. So we don't have that many living donors coming forward. There is a dearth of uh, deceased donor transplants as well. And so not that many transplants are performed compared to how many people are really waiting um, on the wait list. So um, the, uh, how is a kidney transplanted? So what does that entail? So these are the two, kid these are the two kidneys of the donor. Uh, a urologist uh, would then do a um, uh, would do a do what we call a donor nephrectomy. So they would take out a kidney from a donor, either alive or deceased, um, and then they, that would get transplanted in the groin, and that gets all the blood vessels get anastomos to the recipient's blood vessels. The ureter of the transplant kidney gets anastomos or sewn up to the um to the uh it gets so to the um, uh, bladder of the recipient and um if you don't have a compatible donor let's say i have i'm a recipient i'm in need of a kidney transplant um let's say my husband wants to donate but he's not compatible meaning that if he gave me a kidney that kidney would then uh, reject my immune system would reject that kidney um, because we're of a different blood type, say. So, um, but then what we could do is we could find another pair, a donor recipient pair that are also not compatible with each other. And then my husband could donate to that recipient and then that donor then can donate to me. And in fact, we can actually do chains. Um, uh, if we can find a, a donor that can start a chain to a recipient, we can just move along and do multiple kidney transplants uh, through what is called the kidney paired exchange program. So wonderful program gives more options for um, living donor kidneys. So the issue, however, is that when you put a kidney in another person, your immune system is going to try to do everything to attack that kidney because it doesn't belong to us, right? And our immune, that's what, that's what our immune system is trained to do. It's trained to uh, fight off anything that doesn't belong to us, right? Bacteria, viruses, it's gonna do that with a kidney transplant. And we call that rejection. And our immune system is very strong. You can lose a kidney within a matter of days uh, because of rejection if you don't take medication. So you have to take anti-rejection medicines. 
So uh, definitely <clears throat> there is a pill burden that is associated with a kidney transplant. You have to take them daily, diligently. There's a combination of several different medicines. There are some side effects that we deal with. These medicines can increase your risk of infections, risk of cancers, hair loss, ulcers, diarrhea. There is a big list of side effects, but again, um, during these evaluations, we are trying to decide, do the benefits of a kidney transplant outweigh the risks, right? So despite the risk, if the benefits heavily outweigh um, the side effects of these medications, then this is, a still, uh, this is still a good idea. You know, you move forward, you get transplanted, and then you deal with the uh, complications if they come back. So this is what kidney rejection looks like. This is actually a pathology slide. Um, and uh, I figured I'll show you that, you know, the kidney has these arteries and um, the tu kidney tubules that we saw on one of the earlier slides. So this is actually a pathology slide. And you can see all the, these are all the inflammatory cells within the arteries as well as the tubules that tell you that that kidney is now undergoing rejection, that that immune system is attacking um, the kidney. And so then that patient needs uh, further, stronger, heavier immunosuppression, anti-rejection medicines to treat that rejection. And there's a whole slew of medications and procedures that we perform uh, to treat uh, rejection so that uh, we can salvage that kidney and prevent that patient uh, from going on to dialysis. Um, so what does a nephrologist do? What do I do? Uh, so this was, you know, I gave you a general sense of what kidney disease looks like and what the kidney world um, uh, entails. So what I do is then I diagnose and treat kidney diseases related to all of the other things that we had talked about. Um, a patient might be in progressive ki chronic kidney disease, or they might have acute kidney failure related, let's say, dehydration or medications or surgeries. Um, I treat those. Um, I do see patients on dialysis. Uh, we talked about that, uh, but I am heavily focused on seeing patients with a kidney transplant. So I evaluate patients before transplant, uh, whether or not someone could be a candidate for receiving a transplant or donating a kidney. And then after their kidney transplant, then I follow patients right along um, and give them medications that are necessary to keep that kidney. There is also another category of nephrologists called interventional nephrologists. And um, these are my counterparts that do mostly um, procedures such as fixing the veins. You know, we talked about the uh, arteriovenous fistula. So if those fistulas get narrowed, then the interventional nephrologist would go in and put a stent um, or do what we call an angioplasty to open up those uh, fistulas. Um, the interventional nephrologist places the dialysis catheter. They may do a kidney biopsy. You just saw a pathology slide where they take a small piece of kidney tissue, put it under the microscope, and then tell us what is wrong with the kidney. So that's another, um, just like I'm a transplant nephrologist, some, some people go on to specialize, super specialize, to become an interventional nephrologist. So what's my journey been like? I uh, went to med school in India. And in India, actually, there is no uh, pre-med. Um, there is no concept of pre-med. After 12th grade, you go on to do, um, you go on to med, med school. There is a huge entrance examination that you take. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, um, you know, it's, it's, it's exceedingly competitive. And then if you do really well, you go on to med school. So med school there is five years. And then I came here to the US in 2002 for actually a master's in public health at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And then while I was doing that, um, because you're a foreign medical graduate, you have to take licensing exams to be able to qualify to apply for residency here. So they're called the United States Medical Licensing Exams. Um, there are four exams and I was actually studying and taking those exams while doing the, the master's. And then in 2003, I went ahead and applied, interviewed, and then was accepted for an internal medicine residency program in Rochester, New York. Um, so internal medicine residency was three years. And then um, I was chosen as a chief medical resident to stay back another year um, to, um, to um, 
uh, help with the administrative tasks of the medical residency program. So that involved teaching, it involved uh, patient care. Um, and then after that, uh, during that time, it was during my internal medicine residency that I decided that I wanted to specialize in nephrology. So then I went to the um, Cleveland Clinic in Ohio uh, for a nephrology fellowship. And then during the nephrology fellowship, I wanted to really super specialize in transplant. And so that's another year. And um, I did that at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester in Minnesota. Um, right after the transplant fellowship is where uh, is uh, when we moved to Denver uh, for the job. And I work with uh, Colorado Kidney Care. And like I said, I also oversee the transplant program at Presbyterian St. Luke's Hospital. Um, you know, throughout the, throughout the uh, training, you will come across mentors, fellowship program directors that, you know, uh, will guide you through the process um, if, um, if, that's your, if that's your passion, right? If that's your focus. So I uh, can't really thank them enough. So the, the, the different tracks that you could take if you're a doctor, um, you, you could start a private practice by yourself, you could become a part of a group practice. I'm a part of a, of a group um, and, um, um, uh, or you could become an academic nephrologist. So uh, being associated with a university uh, or you could or actually become a, a dialysis unit provider uh, employed nephrologist. So. Um, you could then you just become a dialysis. You just spend your time um, um, taking care of patients on dialysis. If not the M, if not for the MD track, you could also go on to become what it's called what is called a mid level provider, either a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant, and they go to a different school. There's a nurse practitioner school, PA school. They have a different track. Um, they are not MDs. Uh, they do need supervision by a um, by an MD, uh, but they can do all the clinical work, procedures, see patients, write medications, all of that. And of course, uh, RN, becoming a dialysis nurse, transplant nurse is another option as well. So what does a typical day look like? Uh, you could be doing, uh, most times you could do a combination even in a given day. So you would see patients in the hospital in the morning, you're rounding on in patients, and then you would see office patients in the afternoon, uh, just because a hospital patients are sicker, and so they need to be um, seen earlier in the day. Uh, some practices also incorporate um, dialysis unit rounding as a part of the day. That becomes a very long, very stressful day. Our practice doesn't do that. We have separate dedicated days for dialysis unit rounding. And then in between, you're always addressing labs and calls from patients, family members, catching up on your notes, things like that. We do go on call. We do weeknight call, weekend call. And, um, um, and those are hard um, because they, we do have to go in to see the patient, especially the patient needs emergent dialysis, high potassium, high acid levels, um, lungs filling up with fluid or electrolyte disorders, extremely low sodium or um, in extremely high sodium, so things like that, or very high acid levels, things like that. So we do get called in to go in to see the patient overnight. Um, and then um, uh, coverage, coverage in terms of transplant, so covering transplant uh, issues, we might get a deceased donor call in the middle of the night, you know? There is a deceased donor that's coming in, kidney that's coming in from Nebraska. And so we might bring our recipient in to get transplanted that night, for instance. Um, interventional nephrologists also go on call um, with all the procedures that they're assigned to do. Now there are, there are, there's also research on within nephrology. So um, our practice, for instance, uh, contracts with several um, uh, medic, uh, uh, med-related companies uh, where we do, we enroll patients um, uh, in clinical research. So that's, that's an option too. So about 10,000 nephrologists in the U.S. Nephrology training programs, about 150, so 149 adult training nephrology programs in the country. Um, there are about around 430 spots for the first year of nephrology fellowship. Uh, you could either do a two-year fellowship or a three-year fellowship. 
Usually if you're doing a three-year fellowship, then that third year is usually dedicated to research. Um, so most recently, um, so the, the nephrology uh, the fellowship program does go through a matching program, the National Resident Matching Program, which is NRMP. So applicants uh, apply to these programs uh, and then rank their, their program of preference um, in, the, in the order of preference. They might interview at, let's say, 10, and then you rank order them. And then the program themselves also rank order the applicants in their order of preference. And then there is a software that actually matches the, um, the applicants with their particular program. Um, and then we talked about nephrology and P and PA score. Uh, we do have licensing board exams uh, that we take every 10 years. And then just as uh, three or four years ago, they gave us an option of doing what's called a two-year check-in where you could do a check-in exam and renew your license every two years, but most people just do it you know, once in 10 years. It's a bigger exam, uh, but you have, need to keep doing that to maintain your um, nephrology license. So in summary, you know, I would say professional satisfaction, you know, is very high. I, I do think that, you know, we make a difference in patients' lives. We, um, uh, it's very gratifying for me to see patients that go on from having progressive kidney disease or just feeling miserable on dialysis to being um, just being able to live their lives and feel fantastic after a kidney transplant and travel the world and, and just feel well. Um, it is extremely gratifying for me to see that transformation happen. Uh, patient education is a big part of what we do as we have patients go through all of these different phases. And um, that is, uh, again, very uh, humbling to be able to help with that. We do, as nephrologists, interact with different specialties because many different organs affect the kidney. So for instance, if you have heart disease, you might develop kidney disease. If you have liver problems, you might develop kidney disease. And so we're in touch with many different doctors of di from different specialties. Um, and so I, I really love that actually. We also have teaching opportunities as we have residents and uh, fellows that rotate um, through the program. And so we have an opportunity to uh, share um, um, uh, our knowledge. And, and more importantly, you know, as we talked about, kidney disease is a very important aspect of this worldwide health problem. It's a preventable disease, right? Because if you can identify your, uh, the risk factors and really mitigate those by taking good care of your weight, leading healthy lifestyle, keeping your diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure under control, not overusing medications, all of that, then there is a good chance that you could uh, prevent kidney disease um, and or slow down the progression of kidney disease. So it's a, this is just an overview. Uh, it's just a very, obviously just a very high level view, but um, I think that's about it. But you know, if you guys have any questions, concerns, um, uh, you wanna follow up with specific um, situations that you envision yourself being in and anything like that, don't hesitate to you know, get in touch with me. You can email, call, text. I will leave my contact information with uh, Mr. Stirrup. Well, fantastic. So what we'll do is we'll embed this video uh, in, um, in a, a pretty cool program we have and I have a spot where kids can ask questions and what I can do is once I get the questions after they watch your video, um, I can email them to you and then I can post your response, responses via e okay. email. So I appreciate all of you've done for us. And, uh, and it sounds like uh, you guys are in the feeder area for uh, Cherry Creek High School. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Uh, I tell you, we, I know that uh, myself and I, I know the students love it here. So it's, it's a great place. And, uh, yeah, so. yeah. I'm actually going to stop the uh, the recording, but uh, we will still we can still stay on the Zoom.